Good morning. Happy afternoon, everyone, depending on what time zone you are in. We're going to give it just a couple minutes and get everybody to get logged in and we'll be good to go. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know there's a few more people jumping on, but we'll just get through a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we would like to welcome you. My name is Kirsten McPherson. I'm the marketing director for Golden Shovel Agency, and we are super excited to host uh, Lacey and Courtney here with us today from Retail Strategies. I am personally looking forward to this webinar more than I have in quite some time. So. We're going to kind of let these guys jump in in just a few minutes, but just wanted to let everybody know that we are recording this webinar. And so the link will be available to you at the end. We will send an email out to everyone that has the recording of the webinar as well as the slide deck and then all of the contact information you're going to need for, for Lacey and Courtney. So kind of to jump in, I'll do a quick introduction and then we'll let everybody get started. So Retail Strategies is a full service advisory firm that works with municipalities to bring retail and restaurant businesses to the community. Lacey Beasley currently serves as president and formerly as COO. She has been involved in retail real estate since 2005. Her experience with the Shopping Center Group and the Dickinson County Chamber of Commerce prior to joining Retail Strategies provides her with the insight to understand the connections needed from the public and private side of the conversation. A graduate of Lipscomb University, she earned her BS in Business Management Beasley is the ICSC All Government Relations Co-Chair, ICSC Southeastern Conference Co-Chair, and at-large member of the ICSC National Advisory Committee for P3 Retail. In 2018, Lacey was named the top 40 under 40 by the Birmingham Business Journal, included in the nationwide top 100 influencers in commercial real estate, and listed as, as one of Birmingham's eight emerging influencers. So Lacey is going to be my new best friend, and I'm super excited to introduce her today. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, Lacey, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. And I know everybody is super excited to hear what you have to say. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Excellent. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you for that excellent introduction. I'm excited to be here today and talk about retail trends. You know, retail's fun. We can all relate to it. We all eat. We all shop. And especially coming off of this holiday season, then it's something that is a lot of fun to hear about. But retail is certainly changing. So what we're going to hit on today are just what we're seeing with trends, a little bit about opportunity zones, so much hype about that over the past year we're going to touch base on, and then the public-private partnership and how that is impacting development of retail projects. So let's go ahead and just talk about why does retail matter to economic development agencies and communities. Where retail is really popular and we understand it, we like it, how do we look at retail as a catalyst for economic development? You know, traditional thinking in economic development is just to go after those high paying jobs and everybody moves to your community to work in those positions and then the retail takes care of itself. And really that has changed pretty dramatically over the last couple decades because people want to live in a cool community where they can eat and where they can shop and they change jobs very frequently. So retail has become more important than it's ever been to a holistic economic development strategy. And when you're looking at the sales tax collections, the jobs, the property tax, the economic impact of retail really does matter. And what it does is really provides a quality of a place that allows you to attract the workforce that then allows you to attract the high paying jobs. So I would say that traditional thinking and economic development is exactly reversed today. And really that's why retail strategies exist as a company and working with municipalities and taking what we know about retail trends and what is happening with the real estate in that space and empowering communities 
with an interest in this place about how do they attract retailers to their community and what are those best practices. When you break it down, even simple wins such as fast food restaurants really can make a difference. If you locally have a 2% local sales tax and you attract a Chick-fil-A, I mean, that's gonna increase your annual budget by $80,000. So even fast food restaurants can really add up to some big wins for communities. And that's especially true in rural communities. 84% of the municipalities in the country have a population of less than 10,000. So restaurants and grocery stores matter for your economic development strategy. This is from the National Retail Federation that looks at the wages for retail. And you know, often when you're looking at the overall wages of retail, then you're looking at uh, jobs that are part-time, they're seasonal, they're temporary, but if you take those full-time retail jobs, they actually pay more than non-retail jobs, so they do matter. And one in four jobs in America are retail jobs. Again, National Retail Federation, if you are looking for a very localized um, economic impact of jobs for retail, you can go to their website and find those numbers specific to your congressional district. So looking at how retail is a huge sector for our employment, and it helps people at those entry-level positions that matter. So these jobs do really make an impact to our communities and providing those to people, and that's why we exist. It's about, as I mentioned earlier, it's about the tax revenue, the jobs, the quality of life, and attracting new business, and those are your goals as a community and an economic development director. So where do the challenges come into play? It's really having those resources, to understand this space. It's the time allocation for to learn it and the proactive outreach, and it's the connections within this industry. It's a brand new space. The retail industry has a completely different set of players in the industrial side of things, and it's experience. And that's what we do. We help connect communities make those connections. And I applaud each of you for being on this webinar today so that you can learn more about what's happening in the trends and how you can bring those home as best practices to build your local community. And ultimately, it's all about making connections. That's what you do well, that's what we do well, it's finding those players, and whether it's your local broker, or it's the tenant rep broker, or it's the real estate director, whoever it might be, that property owner, it's about gathering information and making sure your connector always in this space. So let's look at some retail trends that we are have been seeing. I think you have to look back historically and say, What's happened in the past, where are we at today, and where are we going in the future? So obviously for anybody on the line, you just came off of the holiday season. I'm sure most of you did, uh, if not the majority of your shopping online, you did a portion of it online for your holidays. So what has happened with our industry? A lot of people that you look at today are gonna say, e-commerce is everything. E-commerce is killing brick and mortar. E-commerce is causing the retail apocalypse. It's Amazon. The consumer confidence, or excuse me, the investor confidence in retail has been diminished lately. But I want to use an analogy in looking at the Sears catalog store. And there were 3,500 of these all over rural America. Sears was the largest retailer in America until 1989 in, when Walmart finally surpassed them. They started the Sears catalog in 1906, started opening stores in 1925, and they had just dominated the retail market up until the last decade, right? And then Amazon came on board, and this is back in 1994, Jeff Bezos is in his parents' garage and says, huh, this internet thing's pretty cool, right? And, and really launches the catalyst of Amazon. Um, if you use that for comparison, around that same time, Eddie Lampert, who's the CEO of Sears, was named by Forbes magazine as one of the wealthiest men in America. Now, had Sears remained relevant, kept up with the trends, stayed up with the times, they could have been the Amazon of today. So that's why it's so important for retailers to be always keeping their consumers in mind and looking towards the future as they incorporate that in their sales models. So this is an, a report that ICSC, International Council of Shopping Centers, put out, and it's called the halo effect. Now, a lot of people are shocked to know that overall e-commerce is still only 10% of retail sales, but it does vary by category. So this is a detailed breakdown of how that varies. 
that ultimately what all the retailers are looking at today is how do you have a seamless integration between your online stores and your brick and mortar stores? And they know that they have to adapt into that model in order to survive long term. And this halo effect talks about how they each support each other. Even Amazon now has brick and mortar stores. So all of the brick and mortar stores now realize they have to have an online presence in order to appeal to the consumer. So what did we see in 2019 for holiday sales? Online sales were $4.2 billion. That was an increase of 14%. So where overall e-commerce is still only 10%, of retail sales. It is the fastest growing trend we're seeing, and we're only going to see growth ahead for that. And estimates are that it will really cap out around 25%, but you still have to have that brick and mortar presence. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about how retailers are doing that when we're looking at predictions for the future. So let's look at online sales for uh, what we saw over Thanksgiving. With Black Friday, it was about $7.4 That was an increase of, of 19%. And the average online order was $168, right? And then you move forward to Cyber Monday, and you're looking at seven, excuse me, $9.4 within that Cyber Monday. And you saw a lot of shopping, a huge surge in big box versus small box this year. But the key driver for these retailers is to get their consumer to buy online and pick up in the store. And that's what they're really looking to do because it's a big challenge for retailers to figure out that last mile delivery right now. And also they wanna keep that product on the shelf as long as possible. That time it spends to ship and then return is time that it's taken off the shelf and it reduces their potential to sell that to somebody else. So buy online and pick up in store is the big trend that we're seeing now and into the future. So let's take a look at what's happening right now. You know, the industry is good. I mean, we hit this year, we hit a 50 year low in unemployment. Consumer confidence hit an 18 year high. Economy is good, that's good for retail. Over the past 10 years, if you look at retailers year over year sales, they've increased by about 4.35% every year. Very positive in what we're seeing in that growth. Um, now, one thing I did want to hit on that I skipped earlier that I think is really important to highlight is what we saw here with our holiday sales with that growth. A good example that these brands are looking to right now is China's Alibaba. On Singles Day, which was November 11th, in 24 hours, they did $38.4 billion in sales, which exceeds Amazon's quarterly entire sales number. I mean, they Alibaba has, is really dominating in what you could potentially do online with sales. Um, so a lot of the brands are looking at them as an innovator. So moving back forward, consumer confidence is good. What we're looking at with same store sales is great. Um, a lot of the big winners that we're seeing here are Amazon, Target, Walmart. These are very familiar brands to you. Um, and looking and forecasting for 2020, estimates are same store sales will be up about 2% in brick and mortar, but about 12% in e-commerce. So it's still good that these brands are continuing to increase their sales every year, right? So why, with the economy being so good, are we hearing all this news about a retail apocalypse? And it's really about these retailers that are closing and the mainstream media grabbing that and saying, Amazon is the death of brick and mortar. Not necessarily true. For the people in our industry, it's a little more complicated than that. Now, true, there were about 9,300 closures in 2019. A lot of store closures. So what's happening there? Why are stores closing when the economy is good, unemployment's low, consumer confidence is good? I mean, we saw closures among Sears, Kmart, Forever 21, uh, Macy's. And you'll see more reports coming out right now in January. It's that time of year when retailers are looking at, okay, let's look at our overall model. Let's look at our underperforming stores. Let's close those and change our strategy so we can make our investors happy, right? So you've seen a few announcements come out recently. What I'd always encourage you to do is look at the number of stores that that brand is closing in comparison with their overall store count. 
So recently, Macy's received several headlines about, you know, Macy's is closing 30 stores. The retail apocalypse continues in 2020, right? Well, they still have 871 stores. And yes, there are some challenges, but, you know, there, it's not a full on closure. Pier 1 is closing about 450 stores of their 950. So that's another example. Um, but Business Insider estimates that in 2020, we'll see about 1,700 closures. So that's a dramatic drop from what we saw this year with 9,300. So what is happening there? A lot of the closures we saw, such as Toys R Us, is a great example. It was basically over leveraged debt, right? They took out a $6.6 billion leveraged buyout in 2005, and they paid over $400 million a year in interest. So it wasn't that Toys R Us, people weren't shopping there and that they weren't making sales. It was just strictly over leveraged debt. And we saw that from several of our brands. What's another contributing factor? It's antiquated technology, basically the internet of things, right? So what are retailers doing to stay up with the current times and give us the things that we demand as consumers today? It's about experience, convenience, speed, all those things, and we demand it. If you aren't going to provide it, we're going to go somewhere else. So antiquated technology is a great example. This slide right here has a series of products that we used to buy and have in our household that we now have packaged up in our phones. And then finally, it's really about convenience. So I don't know how many of you have the Starbucks app. I have it, use it all the time. Great example of where you can order um, right on your phone, quickly go pick it up. You get all your store, uh, all your stars, your rewards points, everything, great system. And a lot of the grocery stores are figuring this out as well. How do you buy on your phone and then go pick it up easily or even have it delivered to you? So convenience is the key. And those brands that did not make it convenient for the shoppers are the ones that were really challenged that we did not reward with our dollars. So finally, looking at one more factor that really contributed to our closures, and especially when it relates to the B and C malls, is retail saturation. Um, if you look at the United Kingdom, there are 4.6 square feet of retail space per person per capita. In Australia, another developed country, 11. What is it in the United States? It's almost 24 square feet per person. So other developed country, we're almost doubling that. So some of this is just a product of being over retailed and it's a market correction in that space. So you're seeing a lot of those big box vacancies that are being uh, filled by non-traditional retail. Uh, churches, call centers, storage centers, and even you're seeing medical and hospitality take traditional retail space. So what is the biggest factor that we've seen over the last five years? Are we eating more out in grocery stores or are we buying more, I mean, excuse me, in restaurants or are we buying more groceries and eating in our home? And I bet you can all guess, you can think about yourself, we are eating out in restaurants now, spending more money there than we spend in grocery stores. So what are the restaurant trends? This is Nation's Restaurant News report that shows every category across the board of restaurants. A brand new report just came out. So we're about to be able to look at those 2019 numbers for the top 200 chains. But you can see huge growth in bakery and cafe. We saw a lot of growth in chicken, um, Mexican food, beef stores. And what I want to point out is casual dining, family dining, and how that is a really challenged area in this segment. A lot of communities we work with say, I want a nice casual dining restaurant. I want a nice sit down place to go after church or before the Friday night football game. And among the publicly traded companies, that is still a real challenge that we're seeing in the growth segment. So the growth is really in fast casual and QSRs, quick service restaurants. Another big trend that people have been focused on are food halls. Uh, this is me actually in uh, Florence. I had a chance to go to Florence, Italy, and they have a fantastic food hall. You can see how absolutely packed it is there. You know, food halls grew by about 700% over the last five years. Uh, but a lot of the landlords you're talking to now are saying, man, this is a challenge. Consumers like it. It's a lot of fun, but it's, a, it's really hard on those landlords because there's a lot of turnover that happens with the brands. And ultimately what they're the conclusions are food halls are best served as an amenity to class A office space. So if they go hand in hand, it works. A food hall standing all 
by itself, not as an amenity to additional uh, real estate, is, is just really tough. So I think we're going to see some changes in the food hall space. But what are the categories where we're seeing the most growth right now? It's really the six F. So if you look at these, it's going to be food. We just talked about uh, fun, fitness, planet fitness. We're seeing a lot in that space. Um, now furniture, a uh, lot of growth there across all the concepts, fast fashion. And this is kind of a play on words. It's going to be physician, right? Uh, play on phonics there. So uh, we're seeing a lot of these kind of dock in the box type concepts. So a few uh, brands here that are doing anywhere from 50 to 100 stores. Most of these concepts are doing for anywhere from 100 to 200 stores. So really where you want to focus is in restaurants right now. That's about 40% of the growth. Um, I just thought this was pretty funny and petty among uh, some of the brands you see Sonic is saying our ice cream works, uh, our ice cream machine works unlike McDonald's. And then they say corporate made, it, made us take it down, petty, <laughs> right? So you're still seeing a lot of battle among the uh, burger joints that are out there. And uh, it's a lot of fence, a lot of growth in that space. But what I want to drive home is that retail is not dying, but it certainly is changing. So now that we've hit some of those trends, and at the end of this, we're going to talk about what we can expect for the future. That's where we've been and where we are. There was a lot of hype this year around opportunity zones. So what are some of the takeaways now that we know where we are? Um, there's a webinar that we have on the Retail Strategies website with Alex Blackspart, Opportunity Alabama. Alex just was really on the forefront of this and has been featured in Forbes magazine and several different publications about being a thought leader on Opportunity Zones, a great resource for you. And also Opportunity DB is a great a podcast that I actually listen to. And uh, Jimmy Atkinson does a great job of interviewing people from accountants, attorneys, communities, um, entrepreneurs about how they are using Opportunity Zones and what it means to them. So a lot of what you're about to see is actually from this Opportunity DB podcast. And when it was first announced, I mean, there was so much hype around this. Opportunities have the potential to be the largest economic development program in U.S. history. That was one of the quotes that came out when it was first released in the tax bill of December of 2017. Well, has that proven to be true? We're going to explore that. What exactly makes an opportunity zone attractive? Basically, what you do is you defer your capital gains until December 31st of 2026. So when this first came out, the initial idea, simply put, was people who had invested in maybe some of those tech startup companies, uh, Google, Facebook, um, even Amazon to that extent, if they wanted to sell their stock, how do they avoid that massive tax, um, capital gains tax that they're going to be looking at? Well, what you can do is basically you can reduce what you would pay in capital gains if you cash out that stock, or you can do it with real estate as well. A lot of uh, real estate professionals use the 1031 exchange to defer those taxes. So you sell your asset. You put it in an opportunity fund, and then you invest in an opportunity zone. And that was the initial concept. So setting up these zones for areas that could attract investment was ultimately the goal of it. I'm not going to walk through this whole timeline, but you can see there that it was introduced in February of 2017, became law in December of 2018, and then we started going through this series of regulations. I think that anybody in this space would tell you it was probably pretty poorly written law. So when it came to um, legislating that and putting the regulations behind it, there was a lot of questions and a lot of feedback and it just took a lot of time. And ultimately, the final regulations didn't come out until December 19 of this year. Well, their initial law said you had to invest by December 31st of 2019 in order to fully maximize this investment. So really just the timing of this scared a lot of investors off, unfortunately. But basically how it works is that if you have an item, I mean, you have an asset and you have a gain, then you set it in a fund and then you hold that fund for 10 years in order to maximize that. Now, you can still invest. You can still, I mean, we've missed that deadline, but you can still do the same thing and you just don't get as much of a value, right? So you can see here that you reduce, 
your gain by 10% versus 15% is if you're going to make that investment over the next couple of years. So the back end savings of this, you still owe that, that gain on the initial, you still owe the tax on the initial gain, but what it does is it defers from the point of investment forward to that seven or 10 year mark then you don't owe any additional gain. So that's the benefit of this. And, and there's a lot of people out there that said, man, I could see this working for me. Does my project qualify? You can either put it into real estate or an active business. So a lot of people were looking at those two options. Initially, a lot of the demand was around real estate. Um, you know, but the key is the benefit of it is all about the gain. So you want to make sure whatever you're investing in it, it's going to have substantial enough gain that you can fully utilize the benefit. And active businesses actually gain much quicker than traditional real estate. So that's what people were looking at. But when they started getting all the attorneys and accountants involved and saying, does this fit for me? I think what a lot of people found at the end of the day, there were challenges and hurdles in this that ultimately didn't make it worse the investment, right? So initially, the attorneys, accountants, a lot of people in this said, oh my goodness, this is the best thing that we have ever seen, and we're going to dive in, we're going to figure it out, then countless hours on understanding how we can utilize this and work for our clients so that they can invest in these opportunity zones, and now a lot of people are questioning, did it come to fruition the way it was originally intended? Um, so there are, there are some winners in this space, um, definitely. Um, let's look at a take a deeper dive on the difference in businesses versus real estate. Uh, one of the biggest benefits that I hit on is you have to have a 10 year hold, so it has to be very patient money. And a lot of times in real estate, that they don't hold for 10 years. So that was one key driver that really motivated people to not stay in the space. Another one, if you were to invest in a business, let's say, you must exit this investment by 2047. So what happens when you invest in a business and it's thriving, you have to sell the business in 2047. So some, some uh, opportunity funds set up as a C-Corp so they could then um, go publicly traded at that point, right? If they saw that investment. But what are some of the biggest challenges of investing in real estate versus a business? Now, real estate is more stable. You understand it, um, makes sense. Business is a lot riskier. The life cycle of a business is the survival rate after 10 years is about 36%, right? So it is um, because you really, you have to have that investment for more than 10 years, then that was another aspect that kind of scared people off from investing in business. So a couple of, of factors here that ultimately when people broke it down said, you know, I don't know that this is right for me. Um, when you look at the zones that were analyzed across the board, how did those zones come into play? Well, there was a, a complicated series of things that, come, that came in that process, and essentially the governors chose those zones, um, and they went through a, a series of different things. So I think uh, initially when this started, the idea was that it would be in, in depressed areas, areas that really needed a, a lot of help and support and investment. But and, and a lot of rural communities as well. Again, I hit this stat earlier, but about 84% of the municipalities in the United States have a population of less than 10,000. So there are a lot, excuse me, <coughs> there, there are a lot of opportunity zones in these rural communities. But look at what they're competing with. They're competing with opportunity zones in Manhattan, downtown Atlanta, Detroit, these just really thriving markets. So as an investor, they, once again, were just looking for where can they get the best return. And ultimately what this became was a hand up, not a handout, right? It's going to make a good deal that you were already working on a little bit better, but it wasn't going to be the initial reason to put investment in that zone. And that's what we found true across the board. So it heightens and enhances projects that we're already in the works in good areas for opportunity zones. And we've seen the biggest benefit for this with multifamily and hospitality. Traditional retail centers, 
um, have not utilized the opportunity zone as much as we might have thought. Now, one example I do want to highlight is Monroe Pavilion in Monroe, Georgia. It's one of the largest shopping centers that's being developed in Georgia currently. And Retail Specialist, our sister company, is overseeing that project. It's about 100 acres anchored by Ross, Publix, Ulta, Marshalls, Five Below. So you can see this is a substantial shopping center in an opportunity zone. So how are they using it? They will have out parcels as a part of that. And so that's a great attractive use for developers that are looking to purchase those out parcels. And a good example of taking a good project and making it more attractive than the exact same project that might exist outside of an opportunity zone. Um, so what does it mean for communities? Uh, there were a lot of papers initially written you know, when this early hype happened, I think everybody wanted to step in and be the expert in the space. And this is an example of a report that came out and, and where I applaud what Bruce uh, Katz was trying to do in October 2018. He gave these 10 steps for what communities uh, need to do for opportunity zones. And it was things that economic development directors do anyway. It was uh, maximize employment, uh, understand your real estate assets. Um, you know, it was just to come up with an inventory of properties it, it was pretty basic things that i think you're already doing but one thing he did suggest that i agree with and thought made a lot of sense was basically developing a perspective and it's putting that package together to say to an investor here's where you should invest and this is why and that was one of the big challenges when a lot of these funds were set up and looking across the country at all the zones that exist they said it well i think it was over eight thousand different zones they said, where should I put my money, right? And that became a bit of a challenge. So those communities that were really proactive in this in the front end said, we want it here, and this is why this makes sense for your investment. Now, what I've seen a lot more communities doing is more of an impact fund that's just about making a difference. Um, I think the initial thinking in this was it was timelines first in wins, and you've got to really rush to it. Um, really what we've figured out past the timeline is it's, it's really about the market and what's already attractive there. But the impact funds are something that would apply anywhere and layering the incentives applies anywhere. This is an example of somebody who does it really well, AltCap. They're in Kansas City, Missouri, and they have a CDFI, which as you know, is a community development financial institution. So what they basically have done here is set up an impact, an opportunity zone fund, and they help support small businesses. So you can really dig in, take a deep uh, dive on them. And when you go to their website and click on finance, there's a link for opportunity zones. And on that pack, podcast, the Jimmy Atkins podcast that I uh, referenced earlier, you can hear an hour long example of what they're doing in Kansas City. So a uh, good example to look at if you want to set up an impact fund locally. Um, but also Ultimately, what are the summaries for opportunity zones? I, the, arguably, my opinion is it was much to do about nothing. And I think there was a lot of pressure on communities to do something immediately with these opportunity zones. And what we realized is it didn't really play out the way it was initially intended. Has to be patient money. You have to have an exit strategy. There was a lot of risk in it. And it makes good, good deals just a little bit better. So there's a lot of participation ribbons in this space. Once again, there are a few winners, but uh, if you were one that had a had an opportunity zone and were not able to attract that investment, I would just encourage you to not feel overly frustrated by that because you are not alone. Um, here's a few resources. If it is something that you still want to take a deep dive on and you are having some traction with opportunity zones, um, this is easy to do it. Good example of an entrepreneur that set up an online way to set up your own opportunity fund. Here's another example that I found really fascinating. Um, Hewitt Jackson, as you know, is the accounting firm. So John Hewitt set up one where people could invest and he's taking his opportunity fund and using it to invest in franchises, which I love because that's commonly a problem that we have when we're able to attract a brand to a community. They say, find me a franchisee. And the biggest challenge they have is finding capital. So uh, what John Hewitt has done here with the Loyalty Opportunity Fund, I think is pretty brilliant. So I'm monitoring that to see how that will play out. And then we have another um, expert here that drove in or use the analytics side of it, right? So he created an online source to say, what are the demographics that make these opportunity zones 
um, attractive to investors. So he did a full analytical breakdown so that they could match up, the investors could match up the, the demos of the zones with their type of investment. So a lot of people jumped on this and we do have a few winners there. That's just a few resources we're seeing with Opportunity Zones. But what I would encourage is to go back to what we were traditionally looking at with public-private partnerships, right? So what we're looking at here is every state has a different public-private partnership that they look at and they focus on that's best for retail in their space. This is the new normal of retail development. Um, some states, Alabama does a sales tax revenue sharing, State of Tennessee typically does a TIF or a pilot. You know, it changes all over the country. Um, Texas is a Chapter 380, right? So you know locally what is your best vehicle to incentivize a retail project. So what I want to focus on here is understanding that retail is the new normal. What is the process? How do you control? What do you do before the ask and after the ask? if a developer comes to you and asks for this incentive, right? So before the ask ever comes to you, here's what I would encourage. Set up an open for business policy. And basically, we're going to take a deeper dive on what this is, but on a high level, what an open for business policy is, it's different than a retail incentive policy. Um, a lot of communities want to set this, these parameters on the front end and then to take it to developers and say, we have this retail incentive, we need you here. Well, what I would encourage you to do is market your community, market the opportunities, and then when the developer comes to you, make them prove a need with this. And if you already have an open for business policy in place that says we will entertain a retail incentive, then you have a process to go through that makes sense and you're not uh, locking yourself in a corner and saying we will only incentivize the deals that meet these metrics because it might be something like a brewery as the catalyst for your downtown that you want to incentivize or it might be a 200,000 square foot shopping center right so you don't want to put too tight of a parameter on your policy so open for business policy and then you want to go ahead and start uh, educating your public officials so go ahead and Tell them about incentives and how retail incentives are the new normal. A lot of communities are used to incentivizing industrial projects. Well, that's what's happening in the retail space as well. So we're going to dive in on some more points about how to educate your public officials in a minute. So after the developer comes to you and says, we need an incentive for this project, what do you do next? You have them demonstrate a need and share their plan. What you want to do is say, give me a conceptual site plan. Tell me why you have extraordinary costs that are above and beyond average and why you need this incentive or this public-private partnership to make the deal work. So make them prove their need for the incentive. Then you want to look at an economic impact study. You want to look at the sales tax you'll collect, the jobs, and the property tax on a very simple basis. Now, that is a direct impact. There's obviously a lot that you can imply with that indirect impact as well, but this will help you determine over the lifespan of the incentive and the ask what you can support to support yourself and mitigate your risk. And then looking at determining risk, that is a big part of it. So get an attorney involved. You want to structure this very tightly. If you are going to move forward on this incentive, you want the project, it makes sense, you have a positive economic impact. We are in support of these public-private partnerships, but I think the next key is making sure that you protect yourself with really good legal work in place. And then you wanna get back to what you do before the ask, you're gonna to have to do it during the ask and after the ask, continuous process to educate your public officials. Um, as you know, that the, there's a, the, they're constantly changing, right? So if you're educating your public officials before the ask, by the time the ask happens and it comes to this point where they have to approve it, you might have a whole new set of players, right? So you're just constantly educating them. And then ultimately, you want to be able to take this, package it up, take it to a vote, right, that you can then um, support and administer over the life cycle of the incentive. So first, let's start with an open for business policy. What do we recommend on a high level that is included? First, 
in order to incentivize this project, it has to have incremental sales tax revenue. You don't just want an exchange, you want an increase, right? It has to have employment and job growth. So most of you probably have a long-term strategic plan that you've laid out, and this is the ultimate goal. So say it's in line with our 2030 vision, which probably has these metrics already included, but ultimately you wanna increase jobs. Um, you wanna re recruit first to market brands as well. So what you wanna be sure of is that you're not incentivizing a project that's just gonna relocate a brand that's already in your city. So the way we look at this, that once you get a little bit further along, you could incentivize a brand that maybe increases their square footage by 30%. Uh, that makes sense, but you don't want to incentivize just a straight up relocation. So first to market, right? And then you want to fill in your spending gaps. So if you do a retail leakage report, market analysis, what you want to do is look at those categories of goods and services where people are leaving the market to buy them. And if you this project incorporates those, then what you can prove is that you are reversing a spending pattern by incentivizing this project and keeping those dollars local. And then you want to look at uh, underutilized property, right? So this can be an adaptive reuse, vacant land, a vacant building, but ultimately you wanna know that there's an increase on that real estate as a result of this project and the incentive. And also increase the property tax base. And as you know, with any incentive, this project would not happen but for the incentive. So that's important to look at as well. So you're open for business policy can simply incorporate a few of these bullet points and things that matter to you locally, things that are in your long-term vision plan. And, but it doesn't necessarily lock in the amount of capital investment, the amount of jobs, things along those lines, right? It leaves it open for your discretion. Then what you add is an application to it so that you can, and, and probably even with a fee is one thing I'd recommend so that you know that the person's serious about this. They have to fill out the paperwork. You incorporate the application and then you're fair to everyone that's asking for an incentive. You get that question a lot. Well, why are you incentivizing them and not me? Well, here's our open for business policy. Why don't you apply for one? And we will go through the steps and we will determine if you match all of our needs, right? So that way you can be remain fair and neutral across the board of the people that are asking for that incentive and you have a board to vet that right so looking at educating public officials there are a lot of questions that very frequently repeat themselves and we're going to dive into each one of these in a deeper level so let's move forward um, this is an example in Cookville, Tennessee, and again, we have a full hour-long webinar on our website if you really want to take a deep dive on the example of Cookville, Tennessee. It's a community of 32,000 people that anchored a shopping center over 200,000 square feet, anchored by Publix and Academy Sports. So incredible project in Cookville. How did they do it? They followed all these steps, and the questions that were asked that not just in Cookville, but in most communities that we work with, when a developer comes and says, I need an incentive for this project, then the first question is, why am I going to incentivize a wealthy developer and take away from our education system, right? Why, why am I gonna take away a teacher's salary and give it to a wealthy developer with a pond in his front yard and swans swimming in it, right? I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious, but that's how uh, some of the questions we get. Well, what I think is important to know is with a retail incentive, you're taking new dollars that would not exist but for the project, and you are applying them back to the project for a period of time. So brand new revenue being captured. You're not taking money away from pot A and applying it to pot B. You're taking brand new revenue and giving it back. So talking about that is important. And in this situation, for instance, in Cookville, then a portion of their retail sales tax goes to the school system. So by incentivizing this project, they increased their school uh, funding substantially. So it wasn't taken away, it was adding to. So there was um, a few steps of education there that were critically important. The next question you get is, when these retailers come anywhere, you know, I, the, the, you know, a lot of locals say, gosh, if you bring me a, 
this big retail shopping center. I'll drive 20 minutes out of the way. I, it doesn't matter where it is. I'm going to go there. Well, that's not necessarily the case with retailers. You know, it's very important for retailers to be at Main and Main, the best site they can in town to outposition their competition, make sure that if their competition comes in after them, that they can't be outpositioned. There's a, a lot of things that are important. It's, it's traffic, it's visibility, it's co-tenancy, all these things that these publicly traded companies absolutely demand in order to open a new location because they're making a substantial investment. So the developer has to protect that investment and they won't go to bad real estate in order to avoid a, an incentive. They're only going to do that good real estate or they're going to go to another community. And I think that is important to know. And that's why sometimes these incentives have to happen is because they're on property with wetlands issues, any kind of extraordinary cost that is going to come beyond typical site work is a challenge. And the cost of construction is going up, the cost of financing is going up, but what retailers are willing to pay in rent has not increased nearly to the same level as the cost of development. And that's the squeeze where the public-private partnership comes into play and why it matters. And that, that's what we're seeing with these larger shopping centers. So you can see here an example of this shopping center on 40 acres that ultimately created 700 jobs and annually generates $2.5 million in sales tax for the city of Cookville, Tennessee. So great example. There are these examples all over the country and everybody wins in this process, right? So the next question that you're gonna wanna look at is, are other cities doing this? So this is an example of several different incentivized projects in the state of Alabama. I think you would need to find them in your own state and just do a few notes. Who, what's the property name? What's the city? What, how large is it? What was the incentive? And who was the anchor? And then that'll help give, provide you some metrics and give you some peer analysis to say, you know, if we deny this incentive, this project will die. It will go to another city, right? But you don't want to get too far out ahead of yourself. So understanding that sweet spot that is mitigating your risk, mitigating the developer's risk, and ultimately allowing the retailer rent they can pay to open in your community. And that's what it's all about. Another question you'll get is, well, is this going to hurt my existing businesses? We're going to incentivize this project to bring in all these brands. And is that going to put the mom and pop business out of you know, downtown. Well, what we have learned time and time again is that success breeds success. There's a reason that pharmacies locate right across the street from each other. You'll notice the hamburger row, right, where you have Burger King, McDonald's, Sonic. They're all lined up right together. They're not scared of competition. They land right on top of each other because that maximizes their sales. And the same is true for a community. So what it does is it doesn't displace the pie and just trade dollars within the same consumer. It grows your trade area. And that's the beauty of retail is you're not limited to the boundaries. So essentially somebody on the edge of your trade area, once you get this new shopping center and they know that they can drive to, they leave their driveway, they can go to the right or to the left for where they're going to get their Saturday daily needs for goods and services. A large shopping center of this scale might change their shopping patterns where they come to you where previously they didn't. So you have new consumers coming to market and you're plugging the gap of those who are leaving the market. So you grow your trade area. Um, this is an example of how we were able to prove that in one of the communities that we work with. We looked at other communities within a 10 minute drive time that looked very similar to them demographically. And then we looked on average how many brands they had per each category. And you can see that on average, then the other peer communities of similar size and makeup had four clothing or six clothing stores and Athens only had two. So they can support new, two new clothing stores to catch up to average. So this demonstrated a need within particular categories beyond just the typical retail leakage report, right? So that's how you demonstrate the need. So next, let's look at the economic impact and we are getting we have about 10 minutes here so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly um, when you're looking at economic impact you want the conceptual plan laid out for you then you're going to look at average annual sales for each one of those brands and ideally you're doing sales per square foot 
and you're going to look at what they can collect and what that means to you annually in sales tax collections. So in this exercise, what we're looking at is average annual sales of almost 800,000, the average number in the employees around a little over 300, and then we looked at property tax collections. So we ran land comps, we looked at other shopping centers and out parcels that were in the community, what they're currently paying in property tax and what those rates were. We applied them to the conceptual plan and estimated that combined it would be about 457,000 a year. So a lot of incentives last about 10 years. So in looking at this, you could see 300 jobs, almost 8 million in sales tax and 4.6 million in property tax. So looking at the incentives, if you incentivize on property tax, you have the benefit of the sales tax. If you benefit for half the sales tax, you still get that back. You still want your return. You don't want to give away everything, right? Um, because you have the quality of life, but if you can find one portion of this to give away to make the project happen, it helps give you an idea of that dollar amount versus what the developer asked for what versus what you can probably offer that makes sense and is sustainable over 10 years. So just to recap, Go ahead and start educating your public officials now. Set up your open for business policy. And then after you get that ask, then you go through these steps. So let's go ahead and, and talk about what we're going to see in the future for retail, right? So surviving, surviving retailers, here's what they are focused on. And ultimately, it's all going to boil down to experience. Um, Here's what they're all the buzz is right now is about innovation. How do you innovate with what you're doing? Um, look, for instance, for Walmart, they're using robots to replace humans. <laughs> and that's something that they're looking at with innovation is not only what they're doing in store with that, but also what they're doing for warehousing and the last mile delivery that it's going to those retailers. Now you look at Nordstrom, and they're looking at augmented reality, right? There's these smart mirrors that a lot of retailers are looking at right now where you can walk up and virtually try on the clothes. Uh, so a good example of innovation that is happening. Chatbots are really important now. So if you go to that retailer's website, they're immediately in your face saying, how can I help you? What do you need? Where are you at? So you could have that highly customized customer service that's happening online right? So that is what innovation is all about. Now, the next thing that they're looking at is basically execution. And the primary way that you do execution is speed. So check out in the checkout in the stores, big deal. So um, how quickly can you check out? Well, we're even getting to the point, Amazon Go is a great example where you just walk out of the store, right? You didn't even have to go to a counter. Uh, so some of the brands were fairly innovative when they did self checkout a while ago well now it's going to be how do you buy online pick up in the store or how do you um, just walk out of the store without checking out or they come directly to you with an ipad and you check out in the department that you're in and you don't have to stand in line for that checkout now even alexa is a good example of this uh you can voice order now and have things shipped directly to you. Um, I was in the middle of cooking one day and I ran out of well, white vinegar, had my hands full. I just said, Alexa, order some white vinegar for me. And she said, sure, no problem. And or whatever she said. So about three days later, I had a whole gallon of white vinegar that I think is going to last me a lifetime. So you have to be careful when you do the voice order that you're getting the right brand and proportions that you're looking for. But I think voice order is going to continue to grow. And it's all about that Uber speed that we are basically demanding. We hit on the Starbucks app earlier and how you can order online and pick that up immediately. Grocery delivery, all those things. So execution via speed is critical. Data with a vision. You know, a couple years ago, the talk was data is like oil. You need it. Um, it it's a, that key driver for how you're going to move faster, figure things out, go from place A to place B, all that. The new discussion today is data is like water. It is so critical to survival. You cannot survive without data, but the key is how do you apply the vision uh, with that data? So with a shrinking middle class that we have right now, one of the biggest challenges is how do you appeal to people, use the data, highly customize exactly what they want, make it quick for them, 
Sometimes the consumers don't even know what they want, but they're on their phone every morning and every night. And you're, you're using data to make suggestions to them, what they probably need, what they want within their price point. That's how you're going to have to capture them. These rewards programs are critically important for the brands right now in collecting data, but it's also how you move around the store. There's Bluetooth technology within stores that help people navigate around the store and they know how long a consumer is spending in each section of the store and how they can keep them longer and capture that sell. And then ultimately, it's going to be about investing. So the big trend we're going to see over the next decade is that Media is now the cost of a sell, and rent is now the cost of the consumer. So think about the physical stores becoming showrooms for an experience, and online is actually where the sell ends up happening. You still have to have that physical store for the uh, emotional connection you create with that consumer, but a lot of that purchasing is going to be online. And three-quarters of millennials say they would rather spend money on an experience than a product so if you can create that uh, where they think they're buying an experience but then they're buying your brand with it that's critical for survival and you're going to see more investment as well in social commerce as the millennials and the younger generations drive towards that now for the sake of time i'm going to fly through these um, what we're going to see is retail reimagines itself, which I've recently hit on. This year, grocery online is critical. I mean, every brand out there is just trying to figure out how do they maximize grocery online with their sales and their deliveries. My friends that have kids, they, you know, to be able to grocery shop online has absolutely changed their life and have them delivered to their doorstep has tremendously increased their quality of life. So um, it's very relatable. We're going to see more and more pop-ups, and especially pop-ups in hospitality. So a good example is uh, Crate and Barrel with Nell and brands like that are putting their furniture in hotels so you can buy while you're interacting with that. Um, let's look at restoration hardware, for instance, as far as uh, retail reimagines itself. They're putting cafes in the restoration hardware. I was recently in New York and was able to go to the cafe. Um, they're in the Nordstrom, which was a fantastic experience that I had in that cafe. So um, you're getting more of that co-branding. Uh, fitness centers in with hospitality is another big part of it um, that we're seeing. So you're just going to see more of a merging of the brands as they continue to go forward. And pop-up stores in general. Um, that's a great way for brands to look at, do test markets and test concepts. And it's new and it's cool and it's something that, that drives us. So maybe you can start with your e-commerce platform with your sales and then you, you test your brick and mortar with a temporary pop-up and go from there. And ultimately, the biggest challenge for everybody is going to be figuring out that last mile delivery. And the question is, can autonomous vehicles solve that for us or will it be drones? How do we maintain that convenience to the customer of delivering to them? And looking at warehousing logistics is going to be a tremendous part of that. So in recap, what did we look at? Ultimately, that retail is not dying, but it certainly is changing. And that not all opportunity zones are created equal. Um, There's a lot of hype that didn't necessarily come to fruition in that space. Not everybody's a loser in that space, but there are a lot of people that participated that ultimately did not see the results of that. Now, public-private partnerships still matter. They're critically important if you want to attract retail. So uh, we do encourage you to look at public-private partnerships and establishing that open for business policy. And then ultimately, the future is all about experience. It's all experience and convenience space. So that is what's driving us. Um, I do encourage you to go to the Retail Strategies website and sign up for our monthly webinars that are there. Anything that we can do as a company to help you with this trend or anything I can do personally to answer any of these questions or take a deeper dive and look at your community specifically, I'm more than happy to do that. So with that, with our last few minutes, we'll go ahead and open it up to some questions. Perfect. Okay, Lacey, I have a couple questions for you right off the bat. Um, the first one is a lot of economic developers. <clears throat> oh goodness, I apologize. A lot of economic developers I talk to want smaller, small or regional retailer versus big box and national brands. How can you identify good a good perspective in the smaller change? 
chains and how can they evaluate these real retailers business prospects? Mm -hmm. A great, great question. So what we look at is a peer analysis. So we look at other communities of similar size and makeup based on a 10 minute drive time. And we identify those brands, there's those uh, communities that are within the region that have a similar population, daytime pop, income and market supply, which basically says the retail synergy you have. And we look in those communities and see where are the brands that are existing there that are not in our focus community, and then how can we attract them? Um, I, I certainly understand that, you know, <laughs> local is the new luxury. Uh, that is local brands and local businesses are what we are craving as consumers. And it, it's brilliant. I'm, I'm that way myself, especially when it comes to local restaurants. Um, and I'll, I'll challenge you with a thought. You know, a lot of those brands that I showed, those fast food restaurants, for instance, the QSRs, as we call them, quick service restaurants, they're going to do anywhere from 100 to 200 new locations this year and another 100 next year and another 100 next year. Dollar General is still leading the charge with over 1,000 new locations every year. So that is a model that is well capitalized and repeated. And we put a lot of focus in that because it's something that we absolutely understand and that we know we can have some success in that level. You look at a local entrepreneur and they might open one business in their entire lifetime. And unfortunately, the sustainability of that is, over 10 years is, is fairly small. Uh, so it's a much harder process to go through to get those local entrepreneurs, but they are the heart and the soul and the character. and We love them. We're big supporters of that. But ultimately, we believe that you should approach both sides of it. And the best way to do that is to look at the communities around you and who are the thriving brands in those communities that are around you that look like you and hit them first. Perfect. This question is in regards to incentives. Uh, Michael asked another question that we get, and I'd love a good answer, is how is that fair to businesses that have been here for years paying their taxes, fees, et cetera, and not getting any incentives? Yes, great question. And that's why that open for business policy should have an application to it, because I think those existing businesses can look at improvements to their business and fill out that application and see if there's, there's any possibility of incentivizing improvement. So, for instance, a lot of downtowns have the facade grant improvement program that, that might uh, apply or qualify to some of these businesses. But I do understand that the existing businesses that are there and have been plugging away in the community without an incentive for 10 years, they say, why are you going to incentivize somebody else to come in? And what we have found is that where there's an initial fear of that, ultimately their sales increase because the more retail synergy you have, the more it grows your trade area, the more people are getting out and shopping and spending their money. So success breeds success. And we found this over and over again, a fear that they're going to be put out of business, but ultimately what they realize is a, an increase in sales. Now, I'll tell you what the pain point is sometimes is they do have to look at investing and upgrading in what they have, which isn't always a bad thing. You know, looking at how do we remodel the store? How do we increase our customer service? So sometimes there's elements on the operations side that they do need to put some overdue investment in and the, having the new brand in town forces that investment, but that is the natural life cycle of any business. Perfect. What's, what's the best structure for a P3 and what types of P3s are most attractive for OZ investors? Oh, the, the best structure for, I, I see those as two different things. So for OZ investors, I think what they're going to look at is a perspective. So they're, they're ultimately going to say, what opportunities do you have for me to invest my money here that will create a 10-year return on my investment? So that's one bucket in how you attract opportunity fund investment to your opportunity zone is you look at the projects that are really good that are going to create a return, which what we're seeing primarily is going to be a multifamily or hospitality. So look at those and, and try to attract them in that aspect. Now, as far as the best structure for P3, what I see is the most typical and common nationwide vehicle for a public-private partnership for retail development is essentially a TIF. 
tax increment financing. And what that does is it takes your property tax, uh, the property tax created on the project that is the increment and applies it back to the project. So for instance, if there's a piece of property that's vacant today, it's collecting $100. And then you put this new development on it. And next year, the property values increase, therefore the property tax increases. And next year, it's collecting $1,100. That is a thousand dollar increment a year, and I'm using soft, you know, small soft numbers just to, as an example. But if that is a thousand dollars a year over ten years, you determine what that number is, and you use that as your incentive. And that's a great way to. That's the most common uh, vehicle I see for that. But there's a lot of different ways to incentivize retail projects, even non-monetary ones. It's it's waiving tap fees and things along those lines. It's, it's uh, any kind of infrastructure improvements with access points, traffic signals, um, and, and sharing of information and sharing of marketing. They're, they're soft, uh, they're in-kind type incentives you can offer as well. But going back to the recap, it does vary per your state, but TIF is the most common I see. Perfect, and we are out of time, so I'm gonna ask one more question and I'll just kind of let everybody else direct their questions to you, to you at your email after this. Um, but the last question is, how can economic developers evaluate retailers to avoid attracting the next Toys R Us? <laughs> Great question. Uh, if they're publicly traded companies, just watch their stock, monitor that stock and uh, understand that you, um, are looking at sustainability long term as you should the same as investors are there's a lot of smart people investing big dollars in these brands so I would say just uh, you know turn on squat box and <laughs> see see which brands look uh, financially secure what we call it a credit um, the a credit tenants are the best ones and um, a lot of things that are you know restaurants uh, healthcare what we kind of casually called doc in the box. Those are great. Um, it's urgent care facilities, fitness, things that people are kind of internet proof, uh, service oriented things. Those are probably going to be a really safe bet over the next five to 10 years. Yeah. I, I would be curious to know how many people have like an empty Kmart setting in their building, in their community right now. We have one where I live. Empty Kmart <laughs> in Shapeway. we <laughs> We've done a lot of work with backfilling the vacant Kmart. So it's been a, a bit huge portion of our uh, partnerships with communities over the last several years. So yes, we understand that model very well. And, and you're right, some turn into retail and some turn into storage, some churches. Um, one was a skeet shooting <laughs> or uh, it was a shooting range, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so they've, they've turned into a lot of different uses. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I keep thinking that we should turn ours into a laser tag, but that's just me. Oh, that's well, fun. Yeah, <laughs> gets into experience, which which matters. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Lacey, thank you so much for being on this webinar. I know I got a lot of out of it. I'm sure everybody else did as well. Just a reminder to all the attendees that this is being recorded. We'll put it up on our website at Golden Shovel Agency under webinars, and then we'll also send out an email to everyone with the link. And I'm sure Lacey and Courtney will be sending out their own follow-up as well. Um, if you want to directly reach out to Lacey, her contact information is on the screen. And thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your January. And Lacey, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Perfect. Everybody have a great rest of your day.